Health care and highways at once. The governor wants a twofer. The first numbers of the year, they don't include all of last year's. The most famous Arkansas traveler, how much trouble his luggage. And a governor, a senator. An assessment of his life and times next on Arkansas Week. Arkansas Week is made possible in part by the Arkansas Times, keeping you informed by covering people, events, and politics in Arkansas. By FM 89, KUAR in Little Rock, with in-depth news reporting, analysis, and discussion each weekday. This is Arkansas Week. Hello again, everyone. Thanks for joining us and Happy New Year. On Arkansas Week, we will reserve probably the bulk of the broadcast to assess the, uh, the life and times of an Arkansas institution, but we'll begin with a run of the news in this first week of January, our first broadcast of the new year. Michael Hiblin is here to join us from KUAR. Public Radio in Central Arkansas, Hoyt Purvis from the Journalism and Political Science Faculty at the University of Arkansas, Ernie Dumas, an independent journalist and a columnist for Arkansas Times. Let's begin uh, at the state capitol. Mr. Hutchinson uh, indicated this week, Michael, uh, I've got two big things on my agenda staring me in the face. One of them is health care, the other is highways. I'd like to get them both done in one special session. Tall order. Yeah, it uh, would be busy. Uh, legislative leaders expressed uh, some concern about putting these items together into one session, but the governor is hoping that he can address both the changes he wants to make to the, uh, the health care system, the private option, or what he's now calling uh, Arkansas Works, uh, and he's wanting to implement more of uh, what he's calling uh, personal responsibility. Uh, the changes also include uh, uh, requiring people who aren't working to enroll in uh, some worker training programs. And this will have to be approved by the federal government. Took a special uh, waiver for the uh, private option to be improved. Uh, the governor announced this week he will be with the uh, Health and Human Services Director, Sylvia Burwell, on February 1st to discuss the waiver. Uh, he'll be joined by House Speaker Jeremy Gillum, Senate President Pro Tem Jonathan Dismang, and the Surgeon General uh, Greg Bledsoe uh, to meet there in Washington on February 1st and uh, see if the government uh, will go along with these changes. Well, the consensus seems to be he may get some but not all of these waivers that he see. Right, and uh, we'll see, uh, but uh, obviously uh, as in every other major issue he's had to address, he's had uh, uh, groups uh, studying this and uh, uh, some of these are among the uh, recommendations and we'll find out whether or not the uh, federal government will go along with these changes. Uh, but the other having to do with uh, highway funding, uh, the governor said also this week that he'll uh, make uh, announcements for uh, uh, recommendations for highway funding on January 19th. He had a group that uh, issued recommendations last month. The proposals include uh, perhaps increasing uh, fuel taxes in the state, also maybe shifting some revenue around. The governor has said he wants this to be revenue neutral uh, so that any increase in funding for highways would have to come out of other parts of the state budget. But this is key because the state has to chip in money to get federal funding for highways. Uh, I forget, maybe uh, 30, 20 percent uh, would have to come from the state to get uh, this other money from the federal government. Certainly doesn't want Arkansas to uh, miss out, especially with uh, uh, the many big projects going on around the state. So uh, he'll uh, announce his recommendations there. But the proposal that both of these be done in uh, one special session, three days, that would pretty much require these plans to be planned out and uh, everyone agreeing to it uh, beforehand. If everyone, all the lawmakers are going to come together and uh, just approve both of these in the, that short a time span, it would pretty much require a consensus to be reached uh, before the session actually begins. And, and right now, we, we don't even have agreement on what the health care, what it will be called, rebranded as uh, 
yeah. Arkansas. I mean, we go from, you know, Medicaid, Obamacare, uh, private option, Arkansas works. Uh, it's it still looks like to me that the future is is not all that clear. And interesting too, the governor said that he's still opposed to the Affordable Care Act. Said if he had been in Congress, he would have opposed this. But at this point, you've got uh, about two hundred thousand Arkansans on the program, low income Arkansans who are now getting health care coverage. And uh, I think there's pressure. Doesn't want to see those people lose. Uh, the coverage and uh, uh, the what he got the uh, private option technically will continue until the end of the year and after that is when then we'll have to see uh, what's yeah now being branded Arkansas works uh, some kind of agreement uh, come into place two biggies in three days that's right that's an awful lot of consensus to well, reach there 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 is uh, uh, there's another reason why he uh, he needs to continue the private option and uh, and that aspect of Obamacare and it's not only concern about uh, the 200 and roughly 250,000 people, 200,000 to 250,000 people who have health insurance now who didn't have it and who would lose it if you lost Obamacare. But in addition to that, and perhaps even more important, uh, is that the state would lose, they would have to make, find about a billion dollars yeah. uh, to make up for the loss of the, the, the federal funding and the impact of the federal funding uh, on the Arkansas economy and on the Arkansas budget. The state budget is critical. So if he loses that, he really has somewhere. He'll need uh, two or three special sessions <laughs> to find the money to, or, or to carve away the money from everybody else uh, to make the budget work if that doesn't happen. Yeah, well, I think that's, that's, the, that's the one overwhelming reality, I think. It is. Well, if, if factor into that well as an aggravate, well, not as an aggravating factor, but a contributing factor. That big tax cut bill that he got in his first session as, of the General Assembly, that's uh, this year is supposed to go into nine figures nine yeah and it's already showing up the previous tax revenue, cuts yeah. the previous tax cuts had been since obamacare was enacted and and took effect in arkansas in 2013 um, there have been a series of tax cuts partly uh, based upon the fact that they could anticipate that the state was going to get all this additional revenue as a result of obamacare so it's said, why not since we're going to get all this additional revenue let's cut taxes and make a lot of people happy so they cut taxes and so now if you if you lost Obamacare you know you you uh, and the private option all of that goes away and, uh, and you're really in serious trouble yeah. well how do you oh, I'm sorry Michael well I was just gonna add to we also had uh, this week uh, Congress uh, pass uh, another item maybe the you know they've had several dozen times when they voted to repeal the Affordable Care Act uh, well this time it was the first time that it's actually a bill has gone to the president's desk. Won't and stay there long. Won't stay there <laughs> long. And uh, our junior senator, uh, Tom <clears throat> Cotton, uh, played a significant role, uh, normally reserved for leadership of uh, the Senate Thursday, by signing and formally uh, sending the bill to repeal the Affordable Care Act to President Obama. But as you said, yes, uh, uh, a veto uh, expected, and uh, uh, the votes aren't there. Republicans don't have the vote to override that. But just another symbolic gesture from uh, people opposed to the uh, Affordable Care Act. And Cotton, in an interview with uh, KUAR, pretty much said he just wants to put the president on the record again supporting uh, the Affordable Care Act. And uh, <laughs> yeah, of course, it I, says. I, I uh, think he supports it. He, he supports pretty, it. Pretty clear. But <laughs> it's just uh, another effort, maybe, can campaign year uh, politics uh, just to say we've again tried to get this repealed. Quickly on, on the other side, the highways, uh, how do you do a, a, a program, to, you know, growth, but just a maintenance program and make it revenue neutral in a, in a time when uh, cars are more efficient, gas prices are plummeting, and we have an excise as opposed to a sales tax in, in the state? Ernie, do you see a general revenue solution being proposed here? Is it inevitable? Well, that's, I, I assume that that's an inevitability. Uh, so I don't know where else you get the money. Uh, if you don't, if you're not going to raise the gas tax, you're not going to raise any kind of taxes to uh, uh, to get that revenue. You've got to take it out of uh, well, there are a few other funds. The general revenue is the main one, and that's primarily education. Education, colleges and universities and the public schools uh, consume more than half the uh, the general revenues, and so. Whatever you do, you're going to take it away from primarily from uh, education, perhaps from health care, uh, 
corrections, maybe river, prisons, river, and that's about it. There's not much else. Yeah. So that's what the, I, I guess the solution is going to be is some some form of transfer of general revenues to the highway department. Okay, let's take a look at November, no, December revenues. We got the numbers this week, as we always do at the first of the month. These don't include, Michael, the critical, uh, often critical anyway, Christmas retail season, which we, the, the budget makers, always hope to have a nice, vibrant yeah. uh, December. Right. The revenue numbers, they were above forecast uh, a little bit, so uh, good there, but it was still uh, significantly below uh, numbers for last year. Uh, and uh, state financial officials attributed that to higher than expected corporate and income tax collections. Uh, net available revenue in December totaled uh, $464 million. Uh, the governor stated that uh, uh, he was satisfied uh, with this, that he still has confidence in the uh, uh, state economy. And obviously, anytime you're at least above forecast, uh, that gives Take you a that, little extra yeah. cushion. Yeah, he was satisfied with that. We got 200 uh, j a federal jobs report this morning, 292,000 created in December. Uh, that'll be adjusted presumably downward a bit, but still an encouraging sign. Um, so we've got some growth going here, Hoy. Definitely impressive. Uh, and Wage gains weren't terrific. Right, and, and the overall employment percent, unemployment percentage is, I think, the, the same, but still a very significant number uh, in, in job growth and something that uh, has, has to be good news, I think, particularly at a time when we're experiencing some uncertainty in the global economy. You see much of a, very quickly, you know, we've got the Chinese economy in an uproar, consumption, uh, manufacturing, everything. I mean, it's just in chaos over there in China, it appears. Yeah, China, uh, um, we you know, sell a lot to as China, we say, we buy a lot. you know, when China sneezes and, you know, everybody <laughs> catches cold. Yeah. Uh, and China is struggling at this point. I think this was inevitable that we'd see some slowdown in China. And there are many dimensions to this. It affects uh, the, the decreasing oil prices, for example, because demand is down in China. China's second largest con fuel consumer. You go on and on from there. There are many dimensions to this affecting the global economy with certainly uh, American companies, American businesses very much tied into the Chinese economy. That could certainly uh, become a more significant factor. And then there are the other questions of not only economic instability but political instability and if that begins to become an issue in China then we've really got something to watch. Well and in the meantime uh, the Middle East and the price war, the oil <laughs> how cheap can we sell it? How much of this stuff can we pump? Yeah I mean it, if you just step back and look and you think, oh, there's chaos in the Middle East, therefore that's, you know, the oil, supply of oil is going to be uh, limited, et cetera. Well, that certainly has not been the case thus far because, as we all know, uh, we see it at the gasoline prices at the pump. They're, they're at, a, at a low that we haven't seen now for quite some time. Quick, some quick national notes. Uh, the first president from Arkansas debuted, I mean, he's been campaigning for her for no, 20 years, in a sense, but uh, stepped out in uh, New Hampshire this past week for a speech. There'll be more. There have been. Well, clearly, uh, we, we all know Bill Clinton loves to, to campaign, and, and he wants to do whatever he can to help uh, help Hillary uh, be elected, and, and he's now taking a more visible public role. And where Clinton goes, there's controversy, but also where Clinton goes, there's excitement and, and enthusiasm. And, uh, you know, I, I think any way you look at it, uh, it's, a, it's a plus for the Hillary campaign. Can, these, can, can it, the, the HRC campaign, can it dispense, or do you think, soon enough with the, quote, Clinton scandals of the 90s, or is this going to be something they have to deal with on a continuing basis? No, I, I think they'll have to continue to deal with it on a continuing basis through the, through the entire election and perhaps into her presidency, <laughs> presuming she gets elected. I mean, that's just the nature of things. The, uh, and, and Bill Clinton's going out and campaigning. There's, there, it's a two-edged sword. Uh, he is popular. He's still, he's a great campaigner. Uh, and you know, I think he's obviously a plus, but nevertheless, it does remind people of that. And again, he will become the target as well as she. And so I think you'll see in the, in the, uh, the, the Republican debates an increasing attacks on Bill Clinton since he's out there. And but so his speeches are kind of muted uh, thus far uh, for, for yeah. Bill Clinton yeah. so far. Yeah. 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 And interesting too, you know, Donald Trump 
he's gotten criticized for being a, a sexist and uh, him returning fire, you know, aiming at Bill Clinton. Uh, so yeah, the, the scandals uh, being brought up uh, again. Interesting. Well, yeah, quick note on the Republican side. It looks to be, a week ago we would have said it's a three-person race. Is it now? Or is it just a two? Are we down to two? I, I think probably uh, we're, da we're still at, at three or, or even more because I, I don't know that Iowa necessarily is going to paint that clear a picture of, of where we may be headed. But I think we're within the next few weeks things are going to begin to be clearer than they than they have been up to this point at least. Yeah. Thought, Ernie? Well, Rubio is, has got to make some kind of push, uh, uh, if not in Iowa, in New Hampshire, uh, and I don't see any, after that, uh, South Carolina and the SEC primaries, uh, he's not going to do terribly well there except in Florida, so he's got to do something in the next uh, next few weeks or I think he is out of the out of the picture. I don't think he's going to quit running, but the other thing is, is Chris Christie uh, may make a little surge in, in New Hampshire and get back into uh, at least getting a little more print, but I think he's out of the question. I think it's basically a two-man race right now. Dale Bumpers, governor of Arkansas, United States senator from Arkansas. Four terms in the Senate, four, or well, two two-year terms as governor, so uh, three decades in Arkansas public service. Ernie, it was a remarkable, he was a remarkable man. It was a remarkable time. It was. Uh, really a giant in Arkansas politics, not just in this, uh, in our modern times, but throughout uh, in Arkansas history. Perhaps uh, the most successful politician in Arkansas history in some ways in that uh, he served uh, uh, two terms as governor, a total of 28, 28 years, I guess, uh, in the highest office in the state, in governor and senate. Uh, and during that course of that, he was never beaten. No one ever really came close to him after the first primary in, uh, in the governor's race in, in 1970. No one ever really came very close to him. And he beat uh, uh, four governors. <laughs> he, he beat the stars. He did. <laughs> during the course of that, uh, th uh, that, uh, that 28 years, he defeated four governors, two governors who had popular governors that had already served, uh, Orville Faubus, six terms, uh, Winthrop Rockefeller, two terms. Uh, and then later on, he defeated uh, two uh, eventual successive governors, governors, eventual governors <laughs> yeah. in, the, in the person of uh, Asa Hutchinson, whom he defeated, our current governor, he defeated in 1986 in a Senate race by a substantial margin, and then Mike Huckabee, whom he defeated in a Senate race uh, in uh, 2002, I guess it was, or 2000, 2002, I think. Yeah. Uh, not 2000, 90, 1992. 1992. Yeah, 92. Uh, he 92. beat all of them by substantial margins. Uh, and not only that, but here was, a, and I think the remarkable thing was, here was a man who had virtually no experience, a very naive politician in many ways, with little money, no recognition, running in a field of eight. He was the last person. He was, he, he was less than 1% state name recognition midway in the, in the first primary. But he wins, and he's able, in spite of his lack of experience, he's able to enact a, a massive, truly massive program uh, in, the, in his four years as governor, which later earned him the title uh, of, the, uh, uh, of the most, or I guess the, the only great the governor only great, of the yeah. 20th century. And I think you could extend that all the way back to 1836 uh, because of the mar remarkable things he achieved in those, those uh, four years as governor. He had to fight for them, too. He I had mean, to it fight wasn't for easy. Them too. It wasn't a lay down. No, he had those, this enormous mandate at the polls, but. He did. He had an enormous mandate at the polls uh, after defeating Winthrop Rockefeller, and that was some, that was part of it, I think, is you had all this Democratic legislature, legislator, and they were thankful that Winthrop Rockefeller, their emphasis was gone. They didn't have to run against his money. Uh, so they were thankful for Dale Bumpers for that, I think. But nevertheless, he had to fight for those things. He had to get three-fourths vote uh, for, to raise the, the, uh, the income tax, the only time the income tax has been raised in Arkansas history. Just imagine somebody proposing an income, income tax cr increase today anywhere in the land. Uh, it's remarkable. So it was able to get those things by forcing the House and the Senate to vote eight times to pass that income tax, to get that three-fourths margin. So, but he did it. And so he did unpopular things as governor, raising the income tax. He goes to the Senate and he fights all of those constitutional amendments so popular in the South about busing and school prayer and flag desecration and so forth. And nevertheless, he comes back, wins handily, Still, and people love him. 
yeah. for doing these things. Yeah, yeah, absolute popularity, and that that was not at all diminished by the kinds of things Ernie mentioned, particularly on these proposed constitutional amendments, which most of which were strictly for political purposes. And and Dale Bumpers uh, made very clear that uh, the Constitution was not something to be tampered with. I think, as much as anything, that is what he's identified with uh, during his, his four terms in the Senate. Well, uh, f full disclosure here, you were working for the gentleman who Mr. Bumpers defeated in 1974. At the time, you were working for the That's correct. Senator, uh, Fulbright. Uh, Senator Fulbright, of course, had served five terms in the Senate, uh, was uh, a prominent national and international figure, uh, also uh, had some controversy attached to him, particularly because of the leading role he played in <coughs> opposing the war in Vietnam. Uh, one of the things that I, I'd like to try to point out to people is uh, it, it's been said now many times that uh, one of the reasons that Bumpers decided to run against Fulbright in 1974 was because um, if he didn't, uh, Jim Johnson, the, the arch segregationist, uh, would run against Fulbright and beat him. Uh, and that's, uh, that, did not, that was not borne out by the polling data that we had which suggested that Dale Bumpers could beat anybody. There was nobody who could even come close to Dale Bumpers. On the other hand, and that of course included Fulbright. Uh, on the other hand, uh, Fulbright's polling showed that while Bumpers would easily defeat uh, Fulbright, uh, others would not, and that included Jim Johnson. What people forget is that in 1968, Jim Johnson ran against Fulbright in a four-man primary. He got 31 percent of the vote. Fulbright got 53 percent of the vote. And Jim Johnson's star had, had waned by that time. I don't think he really was. But nonetheless, Bumpers did um, his, his political advisor, DeLoss Walker, uh, strongly encouraged him to, to run against Fulbright. Um, the Fulbright strategy, the Fulbright campaign strategy, if you will, was to try to get uh, convince Dale Bumpers that he should remain as governor, that would better position him to run for president because we're, there was a lot of serious discussion about Bumpers running for president. Uh, that strategy, <laughs> that political uh, effort on our part did not work <laughs> because uh, he, decided, uh, he decided that he, he would run for the Senate. Interestingly enough, of course, as uh, history shows us, uh, a southern governor did run uh, for uh, president on the Democratic side, uh, that being Jimmy Carter. And, you know, many wonder if, if that might not just as easily, easily have been Dale Bumpers. There, he, got, he came close to two runs, twice, very close, close enough that he was traveling, making phone calls, doing all did. the prep work. In, in, in 1984 and 1988, both times, he, he made some, some preliminary efforts to run for president. Uh, was widely encouraged to do so. He had great support in the, his colleagues in the Senate, even some Republican supporters in the, uh, uh, in the Senate. Uh, but he chose each time. I think health problems, he had a bad knee, he had some knee surgery, it was very painful. Uh, his wife had some health problems at the time. I think that probably discouraged him. Plus, it was just the, the uh, I think he, he kind of realized, I'm not cut out for this kind of campaigning. It might not be cut out uh, emotionally to be president, particularly after he saw the ordeals that uh, Bill Clinton went through um, in the 1990s, and he, and he told me once, I couldn't have taken that. I would have, I would have, I would have died in office rather Michael. than endure all of that. So, yeah. Michael. Yeah, the only thing uh, I can really add was just he, he was an incredibly intelligent, charming person. When I became a reporter 23 years ago, I think he was among the first politicians uh, who I interviewed. And uh, what I appreciated was the fact that he could localize any international conflict for me. He didn't mind, uh, you know, calls at 5.30, 6 in the morning uh, for an interview, and that was always appreciated when I worked uh, early mornings. Uh, but I think worth noting, too, that nationally uh, he's probably best known for the defense he offered of uh, uh, President Bill Clinton in the Senate. Uh, it was after he had uh, uh, just retired from the Senate, but he came back at a time when uh, other Democrats didn't want to have anything to do with the president. The president was kind of toxic at that time, but he came back and made a very impassioned, uh, yet very entertaining uh, speech in the Senate defending the president, uh, saying that the president suffered a terrible moral lapse, a marital infidelity, not a breach of the public trust, not a crime against society. It is a sex scandal. 
it went on to quote uh, H.L. Mencken saying uh, that when you hear somebody say it's not about money, it's about money, and when it's not about sex, it is about sex. But basically said that uh, uh, Republicans had been uh, digging uh, to find anything on uh, President Clinton for years. You had Whitewater, you had any one connected to the president uh, it being investigated, some uh, indicted, put on trial, uh, but said the best they could come up with was a sex scandal, and that did not warrant President Clinton being removed from office. Just seconds remaining. Uh, in declining to seek a fifth term, Mr. Bumper suggested that, uh, well, his quote was, it's not much fun being in the minority. And I'm wondering if anybody here agrees with me that his decision not to seek wasn't the nail in the coffin, but it was a signal that, uh, that bipartisanship in the Senate was pretty much a done deal. Ernie noted that he had many friends in, uh, in the Republican Republican colleagues. I think that was that was uh, that's what triggered his decision in the end. Is he had all these friends on the Republican side of the aisle, uh, from all across the country, in Mississippi and and Oregon and uh, and Illinois and then Rhode Island. He had all these close friends, frequently co-sponsored bills with him. Uh, and he recognized that the, the incivility that had taken over the Senate. Nobody was talking to each other anymore. Uh, there was no social relationship between uh, Democrats and and and, and uh, Republicans. And he just thought the whole process was deteriorating, the government was deteriorating, and so that's why he didn't want to be a part of it any longer. It was so unpleasant. Plus, yeah. he'd have to raise money, and he hated raising money. He thought it was corrupting uh, to ask anybody for money, and he hated that aspect of it as well. Yeah. So well, I think those two No, I, I, I think Ernie's expressed it well. I think it just, all of those factors just wore him down, understandably. I think uh, the, the rancor uh, in, in Washington, the, the lack of civility, uh, that, that was not what Dale Bumpers was all about. One quick anecdote, you told me once, or reminded me once that back in your day when Senator Fulbright was chairman of foreign relations, there was a staff. It served the minority and the majority, and that's right. There was there was no part. There was no majority minority staff. There was a staff, and that's the way most committees worked until things really began to change in the seventies. Change inevitable. Okay, Dale Leon Bumpers, late a governor and U.S. senator from Arkansas. Gents, thanks to you for coming in. Thanks to you for watching. See you next week. Arkansas Week is made possible in part by the Arkansas Times, keeping you informed by covering people, events, and politics in Arkansas. By FM 89, KUAR in Little Rock, with in-depth news reporting, analysis, and discussion each weekday.